Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the North Bedford Republican Town Committee 2018 Questions Forum. Uh, first, I would like everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance by the Girl Scouts of North Bedford. Thank you very much to the Girl Scouts of North Reading. I think they deserve a wonderful applause. For what they've done. The Girl Scouts of America is led by parents who look to raise their children to become our future leaders uh, of our country. So thank you. streamed on the North Reading Republican Town Committee uh, Facebook page. It will also be recorded uh, by uh, NORCAM for a future broadcasting uh, before Election Day. Uh, and it will also be uh, recorded uh, by Janet, um, your last name again, Janet? Aldridge uh, from Hamilton, Massachusetts, and it will be on cable access uh, there, there as well. Uh, we reached out to all uh, possible venues. Uh, all the TV stations were notified of this event, and all of the uh, major newspapers were notified, as was the uh, uh, North Reading uh, transcript and its affiliate uh, papers. The purpose of this event is to be informative. It's an opportunity for many to listen, to possibly hear something they didn't hear before, to help them make a decision. Uh, it's a, it is not the purpose of this event is to take a side or give a specific perspective. We have speakers for that, and we have wonderful speakers for that, as you can see. Um, I want to thank the members of the uh, North Reading Republican Town Committee for helping uh, pull this together, and I definitely want to thank Kitty's for making available this really nice room. They've done a fantastic job here. And uh, so uh, uh, Debbie uh, Berkmeyer and, and Scott um, have uh, been very gracious. Uh, so I think we should give them a hand as well. speaker, and if there are any questions, there'd be 10 minutes available for Q&A. And we would try to do that, one for the yes, one for the no, but that will be all determined by uh, how much time is available uh, to do that. So the first uh, question 
uh, is patient to nurse limits. To limit the number of patients assigned to each registered nurse in hospitals and certain other healthcare facilities. And we took this information off of the voter uh, flyer that was a booklet that was sent uh, uh, by Bill Galvin uh, to everybody. So we, we try to stick as close to that as we possibly can. The yes speaker uh, is uh, Roland Goff, and he represents the Safe Patients Limits. Dot org. So if you please give him a hand. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, and thanks for uh, inviting us out here to talk to you about number one. The question, um, obviously, you've probably seen and heard a lot of it already, so I'll just do kind of a quick run through and talk about how we got to this point of being on the ballot um, and a few points, and obviously, we open up the questions. So. Um, Question one would establish nurse to patient limits in each unit except for the ICU in Massachusetts. We already have a law in Massachusetts that sets a limit in the ICU. That was done about four years ago. We're now trying to expand that out to every unit in the acute care hospital setting. We believe that more nurses equal better care. And there are going to be studies that you can see on our website. There's a whole list. If you go to our website and look under the tab, the evidence, you'll see. And a lot of the studies will confirm that more nursing care is better for patients. So you'll see that with each additional nurse, there'll be about a 17% reduction in complications. Also, Massachusetts right now ranks almost last in readmissions among the 50 states. We believe if this law is implemented, we can cut down on readmissions, which is better patient care, and we'll also cut costs. So when we look across the state of Massachusetts, we see a variety of things. We see places in Boston, if you go to Mass General, or you go to Brigham, are you likely to get the nursing care that we speak of in question one? On most cases, yes. But you're not going to get that same benefit in certain hospitals across the state, but you're still paying the same premium. You're still hoping to get the same care, but you're getting different care because there's no standard across the state. We don't believe that's the best way to deliver care to the Commonwealth residents. Um, the second thing, this has been about a 20 year struggle. The nurses have proposed a ballot, I mean, a, a law to the state legislature for about 20 years to establish these limits. The only breakthrough was a few years ago when the um, legislature agreed to institute this in the ICU. Um, we believe that's been a success. We believe it's improved care in the intensive care units, and we believe that by moving out to the other units, um, you and your loved ones will get better care. Um, the other thing is you should know is there's only one other state that has limits, and that's California. We believe the California experiment and experience shows that these limits work and that they're beneficial for everyone in the state. Uh, also, that's cost is an issue, and I think you probably read a lot. And HBC came up with some estimates, and you've seen a lot of cost estimates. Um, I think a lot of those cost estimates are inflated, but it still only amounts to about 1% of the, of the revenue of the hospital in Massachusetts. So I guess when I look out there, if I was going to be a patient in my local hospital, I would like to see my local hospital add 2% to cost to make sure I have better care. So those are really the kind of big things. We believe that will make better care. We believe California has proven that these limits work. We also believe the ICU law in the state of Massachusetts proves that limits will work. We also believe, although there will be a cost, that it will not be um, sufficient, not be at a level that will have effects um, services or hospitals in Massachusetts. In California, there were no closures after they passed their law establishing these limits. Um, we do not believe that there should be any closures here when yes on one becomes the law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, ne up next for the no speaker is Kim Stevenson. She represents the ProtectPatientSafety.com. She's a research manager at the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so 
I just want to talk, I'll try to go through the same uh, list um, as Roland. Yes, um, as Roland went through. Um, so, first and foremost, um, the, the MA has, who's brought this question forward um, has tried to position this as a bedside nurses versus executives uh, fight. And I just want to point out that that's absolutely not the case. Um, WBUR recently put out a poll. Um, in which nurses were pretty much evenly split on this. And even looking at members of the MA, 33% uh, of MA members who are polled are opposed to this question. Um, so that's the group bringing it forward. They don't even have unanimous support among their own members. Only 15% of nurses think that a ballot question is the way to handle this. 15, 1, 5, not 5, 0. So I just want to put that out there right now. Um, the reason why we're opposed to this question is not because we don't like nurses or that we don't believe that nurses provide excellent patient care. Um, nurses absolutely provide excellent patient care and of course more nurses is better. The problem is with the rigidity of these ratios that would be applied to every single hospital across the state in the same manner. When every hospital in the state does not provide for the same type of patients, the same clinical problems, um, they don't have the same nurses um, and the same facilities, technology, resources, etc. Um, so for example, uh, Boston Medical Center is one of the biggest trauma centers in New England. Um, they see very complex cases, um, a lot of sick patients versus, for example, Haywood Hospital out in Gardner, um, or Athol Community Hospital, or Nantucket. A lot of these community hospitals, they send their more critical patients to the academic medical centers because they have the skills, the expertise, um, and the resources to be able to provide the elevated level of care that's required. Um, so no two patients are the same, no two nurses are the same, no two hospitals are the same. So why we would try and staff every single hospital the same, it just doesn't make any sense. The bigger issue is that for complying with this law, there's really only two ways to come into compliance. Um, because these ratios to be very strict, it would be at all times, which means 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So that means you have the same staffing levels at 2 a.m. as 2 p.m. Even though there's no testing going on at night or no procedures um, other than maybe emergency stuff. Um, so the level of care is not necessarily the same, particularly for stable patients. Um, as you know, in the middle of the night when patients are sleeping, as it is during the middle of the day when they're getting testing and procedures and um, therapies, etc. So, to comply with the ratios, you either have to staff up your levels and hire however many more nurses in your facility to meet this at all times mandate, which is more than just looking at averages, or you have to decrease the number of patients that you see because every time a hospital violates one of these ratios, they can be fined up to $25,000 per incident per day. Um, and as you can imagine, these fees can rack up pretty quickly. So what we are most concerned about is that there aren't, one, there aren't enough nurses to be able to comply with the ratios and meet current patient demand at all hospitals in the state, and also that even if there were enough uh, nurses um, some hospitals, um, just because of their payer mix, uh, that are more reliant on public payers that don't reimburse at the same rates as the private payers, so like Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, um, versus Medicare or Medicaid. Um, hospitals would have to cut services, programs, other staff member types, um, other members of the care team. And care really is provided by a team. Nurses are not the only ones providing care at the bedside. You have respiratory therapists, you have pharmacists, you have um, nursing aides, licensed practical nurses, um, physicians, residents, etc. So it's not just nurses. So the Health Policy Commission, which is an indep independent body, um, independent state agency, estimated that the cost for this would be uh, upwards of $950 million per year um, across the state. And they also said that this was a conservative estimate because they were not able to account for emergency department nursing increases and also other costs associated with outpatient units, observation units, and um, the initial implementation of the acuity tool. So the Massachusetts Association of uh, Health Plans has already said 
based on the HPC analysis that um, insurance premiums would likely rise because it's likely, as we saw in California, which I'll get to in a moment, um, that hospitals will have to go, they can't negotiate with Medicare and Medicaid, um, but they can negotiate with the private payers and they said it's likely that hospitals will try to renegotiate um, payment for, with the private payers and that these costs would likely get passed on to um, consumers. So California is not a model to emulate. There are some significant differences between the two laws, I'll get to in a moment. Um, but first of all, uh, there's been over a dozen studies on California I've read them all. I've read all 73 studies on the m &A's website, and I've read about 200 others on top of those, um, or maybe more. Um, so I've, I've done my research on the research. Um, the Health Policy Commission hired Joanne Spetz, who's a researcher from the University of California, to speak, and she participated in their study, their analysis. She has studied California since the beginning. Um, she studied it more than any other researcher in the country. And she, she concluded that there were no systematic improvements to patient outcomes in California, no but there were uh, increases in costs um, and financial implications on hospitals. So in the research, we see everything that we've been stating. Longer increased ED wait times for emergency departments, um, holding the wall. If you Google holding the wall California, you will see all the things that we're talking about, um, publications, blogs, etc. Uh, on this phenomenon where paramedics are they're just waiting on the sidelines for nurses to be able to have a patient um, discharged so that they can take on another patient. Um, other things that we saw were disproportionate effects between safety net hospitals, those that provide care for the most vulnerable patients in the state, and other non-safety net hospitals. Um, even Linda Aiken and Matthew McHugh, who the m and site very frequently um, they did a 2012 study on this and they found that not only did safety net hospitals have lower staffing levels before ratios were implemented in California than the non-safety net hospitals, but this trend continued after ratios were implemented. They had lower rates of compliance um, and they found that through wage inflation for nurse salaries, the safety net hospitals actually lost a lot of their good nurses to the non-safety net hospitals um, because they weren't able to pay as much. So nurses left the lower paying hospitals to the higher paying hospitals. Um, there's some key differences between California and Massachusetts uh, law in the ballot proposal. California had five years to implement their ratios. Their law was passed in 1999. Ratios did not go into effect until 2004. Um, and even at that point, it was a phased in approach where they had a starting ratio in 2004 and then it increased in 2005 and 2006 and finally in 2008. They also allow the ratios to be met up to 50% by licensed practical or vocational nurses. The m &A's ballot requires the ratios to be met exclusively by registered nurses. Um, California also allowed hospital waivers for small and rural hospitals. The m &A's ballot explicitly forbids any such waivers for any reason. Um, and that's in the ballot, I've got copies. You're welcome to take a copy of the ballot uh, before you leave. Um, other key differences, California does not have penalties, so the hospitals that are not in compliance are not getting fined, you know, upwards of $25,000 per day, um, like hospitals here would. Um, and finally, just the support for uh, 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 the opposition to this ballot, um, just not just business groups, although we have many business groups on our side, um, there's eight professional nursing organizations representing Massachusetts nurses opposed to this more than 60 physician, community health center, home health agency, uh, and other behavioral health groups that are opposed to this, and every single hospital in the state is opposed to this. Um, it's likely that for behavioral health, where we are seeing a very significant opioid epidemic right now, would have to close nearly 1,000 of 3,000 plus beds if this passes. Um, there's a huge shortage of nurses, especially in psychiatry, um, this would be just devastating. Um, we graduated about 3,500 nurses a year, but about 4,500 are retiring or um, leaving the field to take care of family. Um, so there just aren't enough to replace them without ratios. Ratios would add another 45, 4,700 nurses that we would need on top of that. And we currently have 1,200 vacancies in the hospital.
Thank you very much. Uh, that was perfect. As soon as he gave me the signal, you were done. Um, but, uh, okay. So now we're going to open it up to Q&A. I'm sorry, Q&A. Uh, when I give you a signal, you can start since I hear if there's a question. Does anybody have a question for either of these two speakers? Yes, sir? State your name and where you live. Irene Newell, I live here in North Reading. Um, so my concern, I guess, about um, the increased costs, I think you know, the, the yeses will say it's not that, that high, the noes will say it's much higher, and I think we understand that. But it will definitely increase. My concern, I think, is mostly with the, um, the neighborhood hospitals, the ones that are out in, you know, the, what you were calling, you see, what one, one of them was, um, like Haywood Hospital, or the community hospitals around. So their budget is already pretty skimpy, I think, right? And if you add on this expensive talent, um, my fear is that they're not going to be able to sustain those increased costs. And rather than um, go under, they're going to try to not do that first. Um, but if they have to, then they'll be the big conglomerates of Partners Healthcare, Tufts, um, BMC, um, Beth Israel. They will, you know, um, probably easily want to um, bottle these guys up. Um, the other, the other. So that's one concern. So maybe one of you can speak to that. The other is the community hospitals. Sometimes, like, how would services affect it? For instance, some people don't want to always go into Boston for, let's say, um, um, dialysis. So we can't. So you know, Lawrence Memorial, let's say, we can't provide those services anymore because um, it's too expensive. We have to cut back. We can't cut back on staff, but we can. We have to cut back on services. So to what degree could that happen? Because now people can't go to their community hospital. They have to now go into a larger city. I assume your question is to both? Either okay. Would you like to go first? Uh, on the community hospital question, um, you know, because I live in a community, and I, my community hospital, like I'm walked to. Um, but uh, unfortunately, in Massachusetts now, pretty much every hospital is part of a system. And all these systems are very profitable. So, for instance, you know, Haywood is still hooked up with Health Alliance in the UMass. Um, so they are profitable entities. If you look at, like, I live in Winchester, I can walk to the hospital. Winchester made $142 million over the last five years, now they're going to be part of Leahy, which is also making. So I think that in Massachusetts, the hospitals have enough money to both meet the question one demands, but obviously still be operational. We would not be putting forth this question if we thought it was going to cause closures of hospitals. We've always fought against the closure of hospitals. We also fight against the closure of services. So I do believe Massachusetts is in a good position to both fund this and still be able to operate the hospitals that are there. Um, so the Center for Health Information and Analysis is another independent state agency. Um, feel free to Google them, CHIA, that's what we call it. Um, they actually do uh, reports on hospital finances every single year, and actually think that they put out mid-year indicators as well. Um, so if you look at the reports from CHIA, it's all publicly available data, anybody can access it. Um, the hospitals, uh, the m and is putting out this big number, $28.5 billion industry. That's the revenue that they took in, uh, I believe, for 2016 or 2017. Um, what they don't say is that expenses were $28 billion, which means you have half a billion dollars left over after all of that. Um, more than 80% of hospitals in the state are nonprofit hospitals, even partners is nonprofit. Um, that money goes back into investments in staffing, facilities, resources, and community benefits. Um, another story that's not told enough is that hospitals provide um, hundreds of millions of dollars in community benefits, that's uncompensated care for patients that can't um, afford to pay for it, um, cancer screenings, uh, behavioral health, opioid uh, or addiction services. Um, hospitals last year provided $600 million in community benefits. Um, this is all money and benefits services programs that we are very, very scared 
um, will be cut significantly um, to pay for it. The $28 million is not distributed equally among all of the hospitals. Yes, some hospitals are in systems. Haywood is not part of a system. Um, but there's a lot of community hospitals, um, I believe, I think it's, I want to say close to 14, that are already operating in the red. Um, right now, they're already in negative margins. Um, this ballot would do more than double the number of hospitals that go into the red. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? State, uh, no? State your name and we, what town is it? How you doing? I'm Rex Whitmore. I live in North Reading. Uh, I have one question and one question only. How will this make Massachusetts hospitals better? I already know that a lot of people come to Massachusetts to get health care because we are already renowned for having great health care. So how is this going to improve it? Okay. Um, so you went first last time. You can go first this time. That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> excellent question. It won't. Um, if anything, it'll make it worse because of decreased access to care. Um, Massachusetts is a leader in quality among almost all quality indicators. We have the lowest mortality in, in hospital mortality rate in the country um, per the Commonwealth Fund, again, publicly available data. Um, we also score very well on infections, uh, low rates of infect hospital infections, um, patient safety indicators. We have very high patient satisfaction. And uh, just to compare back to California, again, the only state in the country that has um, mandated staffing ratios. So for example, the Commonwealth Fund, um, they rank Massachusetts number two for healthcare. Um, California's ranked 14. Um, the Agency for uh, Health Research and Quality, um, which is another government agency, they also have state rankings publicly available. Massachusetts is ranked fourth. California's ranked 42nd. Um, leapfrog safety scores for hospitals also publicly available data um, that's measuring all hospitals on a grade of A to F. Um, Massachusetts has no hospitals that have a D or an F grade. Hosp uh, California has many and taken as a whole across the state. Massachusetts is ranked fourth. California is ranked 25th for hospital safety. So if mandated ratios are truly the answer to improving quality, why is California at the middle or the bottom and Massachusetts is at the top. Um, you know, we do have very good health care here, but there are certain things that we're not very good at. I mentioned earlier, we are last in readmissions. So that means something's getting missed. If you're in the hospital and then you are discharged and have to come back, then something went wrong. And hospitals are penalized for that. So I think a couple of things. One, the hospital will be better off as the readmission rate goes down. They won't be penalized by CMS. And also, it'll probably save about $80 million per year. And the only the last thing I would just say is um, the leapfrog that she cited, leapfrog is a pay to play. You have to pay to have them review you, so I don't think that's particularly relevant. Is there, are we, are we, well, if you can respond to her, you can respond to her if she. I didn't respond the first time, but that was Okay. Okay. I have two minutes to go. Does anybody have another question? Name and town you live. I'm Eli Spicer and I live here in North Reading. So my question is more of a general one as to why you're deliberately misrepresenting data. Sure, they do say it could cost 950 million, but that's on their high end. That's their non-conservative estimate. Their conservative estimate was 676 million. So you said that their 950 million was their conservative, but it's not. Okay. She can defend herself. But just quickly in the cost estimate, I will say the HBC number basically was about for every FTE that would need to be added, they came up with a figure that cost about 300,000 per FTE. I think that's wildly high. If you look in the red book that you received from the Secretary of State, 
if you look at the cost to the Commonwealth, because it covers some state hospitals, their cost estimate is about 140,000 for FTE, which again, I think might be a little high, but it's much more in the range. The HPC, 300,000, seems wildly erroneous. That's a great question. I have the HPC report right here, also publicly available. I encourage everyone to go look it up. So what they did was they had, it, it wasn't a, one conservative estimate and one non-conservative estimate. Um, what they did was they had two different models. Um, the whole thing was uh, stated as a conservative estimate. Hold on, I'm just trying to find the right page. also not estimating $300,000 per nurse either. Um, so this is a sheet. I'm happy to show this to anybody if they want after the meeting. Um, and again, it's also publicly available on the mass.gov website. Um, this, it, they did two different analyses where they estimated um, wage increases separately. Um, so they estimated, uh, I believe, a 4% wage increase for nurses in one model, 4% or 6% in the second model. Um, and then there was uh, also, they explain all of the different details. Um, but so they came out, you're right, 676 million to 949 million. And the text at the bottom here says the estimated costs are likely to be conservative as they do not include any costs related to implementation in emergency departments, observation units, and outpatient departments, as well as other one time costs. See next slide for additional information. So I believe that's exactly what I said when I was representing it. Um, and here it says uh, the ongoing costs do not include uh, emergency departments, observation units, outpatient departments, increased R and staffing costs to non-acute hospitals, state agency implementation costs, and penalties for non-compliance. Um, and other costs not included are the uh, one-time acuity tool costs that they estimate to be uh, almost $60 million dollars. Um, and turnover costs for RNs um, who might be moving from one facility to another should this pass. Um, the cost breakdown here, the, the total for RNs, um, it, it's not just the per RN total. It's the acuity tool, it's the uh, wage inflation, it's the state hospitals. So there's, there's a lot more cost here than just how many nurses that they need. Does that answer your question? Thank you. And that brings to a close question number one. I thank you both very much. As I said earlier, everything is to be informative. Uh, you know, it doesn't end here. Uh, you still have to go home and do some homework uh, because there's always something new and something different that uh, uh, you have to uh, pay attention to. Uh, we're going to move on to question two, and by the way, I, I didn't mention this before, but we, our timer is right here, and he will give you a two-minute, sorry, question number one, I didn't say this, <laughs> but he will give you a two-minute warning and a one-minute warning, and then if you're still talking, I just jump on the stage and grab the mic. So, uh, so question two to create a citizen's commission to recommend potential amendments to the U.S. Constitution to establish that corporations do not have the same constitutional rights as human beings. The yes speaker is Leo Immelman uh, for wethepeople.org. Leo is a lifelong resident of Massachusetts who has served on the Rentham Zoning Board of Appeals and is the current chair of the Conservative Conservation Commission. For the past four years, Leo has been volunteering with the We the People Mass of Massachusetts uh, group. Uh, they believe that we need to amend the U.S. Constitution as described in question two. So Leo, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate that. As you mentioned, I'm a volunteer with We the People Massachusetts and we're working towards amending the Constitution again, Amendment Number 28. And we support 
question two, because it has two planks that we feel are important. One, the rights protected by the Constitution are the rights of human individuals only. And two, the spending of money to influence elections is not protected free speech under the First Amendment, and therefore Congress and the states shall regulate it. So the question is, why is this amendment needed? We now have unlimited, unaccountable, independent expenditures streaming into our political campaigns. This is undermining the Republican and Democratic parties. Historically, our parties have identified, supported, and developed candidates who represent the core beliefs of the members of those parties. We, recently, we are finding elected, well-funded candidates are responsible to their donors and not the party. We are losing our ability as citizens to govern ourselves to the wealthy elite of our society. And I find this deeply disturbing. So how did we get to this point? In the late 1960s and early 70s, our government legislated actively on behalf of the people. Our government passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. They created the Environmental Protection Agency. These environmental laws and other labor and consumer protection laws caused big business to feel as if they were under attack. As a reaction to this, the United States Chamber of Commerce asked corporate lawyer and tobacco company director Lewis Powell to write down how big business could respond. His paper laid out a multi-pronged plan to get that more power for big business over our government. As a result, for the past half century, we have been subjected to a massively funded campaign by national and global corporations, and the right-wing billionaires that they created to take control of our democracy. Furthermore, to prepare the legal basis for court battles, new legal foundations were created and funded. Attorney Jeff Clements, author of the book, Corporations Are Not People, and the drafter of question two, commented on these foundations by stating, these legal foundations were intended to drive into every court in the land the concept that corporations are persons with constitutional rights against which the laws of the people must fall, end quote. Thus began a whole series of court decisions that declared that corporations to be persons and gave them protections under the Constitution granted by the Bill of Rights from government regulations. For centuries prior to this, it has been understood that a corporation was a separate kind of person, an artificial person. In particular, when a group of people want to go into business together, they file to a state for a charter. Once the charter is granted, the law treats the business as if it were one person, so that, that they can do such things as enter into contracts, file lawsuits, and own property. This gives the corporation a limited kind of legal personhood, and that's perfectly okay. Corporations need to be able to function that way. We are not seeking a change to that. Well, that's really different from saying that they have all the rights of people under the Constitution. These are natural rights that are inherently part of who we are as human beings. We support local businesses and local corporations. They are the backbone of our local economy. <coughs> this bill will not change the way they do their business. The laws controlling how they run their businesses are well established. These businesses will retain their legal personhood. What we object to is when big corporations, not our local businesses, use their claims to personal protections under the Constitution. Laws passed to protect our health, environment, and public interest have been overturned in the courts by corporations 
claiming their rights as persons under the Constitution. These legal precedents led to the 2010 Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus FEC, in which the court ruled the parts of federal campaign finance law passed by Congress were unconstitutional based on their belief that corporations have constitutional rights and money spent in elections is protected free speech under the First Amendment. Corporations and billionaires can now spend unlimited amounts of money to influence elections as long as that money is not donated directly to the candidates or the political party. Thus, the birth of the super PAC and the other dark money operations. So what are the problems we need to address? One, we are living in a legal system that has given global corporations the ability to go to court and overturn public interest laws. And two, Congress and the states no longer have the power to regulate campaign finance. In order to achieve what we all believe is a bedrock of our democracy, equal representation for all. So how can we fix these problems? A constitutional amendment is the only lasting way that people can overturn Supreme Court decisions. The amendment must overturn these two most anti-democratic court findings by affirming that one, the rights protected by the Constitution are the rights of human individuals only, and two, the spending of money to influence elections is not protected free speech under the First Amendment and therefore Congress and the states shall regulate it. Question two is a chance for Massachusetts voters to demonstrate support for this two-plank amendment. Then once passed, it sets up a citizens commission to work during 2019 to advance the amendment in Massachusetts. The committee will consist of 15 citizens reflecting a range of geographic, political, and demographic backgrounds. The members will be appointed by the governor, secretary of the state, attorney general, president of the senate, and speaker of the house. Each will nominate three people. The commission will research, hold hearings, and make recommendations to its drafting, promoting, proposing, and ratifying such a constitutional amendment. Have the people ever had to overturn Supreme Court decisions before? Yes. The Supreme Court has got it tragically wrong before. The Supreme Court ruled that both African Americans and women were not equal citizens, and that 18-year-olds fighting in Vietnam did not have the right to vote in local elections. To reverse these mistakes by Supreme Courts, the people have won constitutional amendments, and we can do it again. Today, I'm asking you to help correct the errors inherent in Citizens United. I urge you to vote yes on question two. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. I don't bring my glasses, I can't see your thing. <laughs> okay. All right. And no speaker uh, is Paul Craney for question two. He's a spokesperson and board member for the Mass Fiscal Alliance. Paul is a first generation American whose mother immigrated to the United States from Mexico City, Mexico. A graduate of Gordon graduate of Gordon College. Paul moved from the executive director to spokesperson, serving on the board of Mass Fiscal Alliance. Please welcome Paul. Thank you, Jeff. Sounds like you got that from our website or uh, our LinkedIn profile or something, but that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Leo bringing up uh, campaign finance law. It is not an easy topic to follow, and I'll probably be your briefest speaker up here. Um, but just Briefly, show of hands, how many people actually know what Citizens United is? Besides you've heard about it, like, do you know what it actually is? Like if someone asks you, do you know what Citizens United is, can you actually... Explain it to us. 
It's a, it's, a, it's a buzz kind of word phrase that's used a lot. Uh, it is a Supreme Court decision. A group of citizens that assumed were united wanted to put together a documentary about one of the presidential candidates. And they went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, you're allowed to do this documentary that talks about Hillary Clinton. That is the famous Citizens in a case. It doesn't seem too bad. Because what the case essentially did was it allowed individuals, which is all of us, corporations, which also includes nonprofit corporations, and unions to all have the same amount of speech in elections. They can have an unlimited amount of speech so long as they don't coordinate with the candidates they're trying to help elect or the political parties. So in campaign finance law, you want to look at a few things. The two metrics I tell people is it has to be fair so everyone can follow the rules and it has to be uh, clear. Uh, so that every side has an opportunity to follow the rules. Uh, Citizens United that happened, uh, they gave, again, individuals, corporations, which include nonprofits, and unions the same amount of speech in elections. Prior to that, you had decades of campaign finance laws in all 50 states and the federal government that were layered on top of each other. And the Supreme Court ruled because it was becoming too murky. And a lot of times, elected officials used the system to silence their opposing views or opposition. That's just the way campaign finance law oftentimes is used. Uh, so that's kind of just a brief overview. Um, I want to talk about Citizens United, why it actually benefits, as you probably heard uh, Leo uh, speak, it benefits corporations. A lot of times, big corporations are beaten up for that. But it actually benefits a lot of other organizations and individuals and people that want to use their speech. Um, Oftentimes you hear about, uh, try to remember some of the, some groups that Leo was talking about, but let's just use like ExxonMobil. Big companies that are a lot of times the boogeymen, uh, where they come in, they sweep in in elections, they spend a lot of money. Uh, what they're essentially trying to do is come out there with their speech, come out and talk about different candidates running for office or different positions, which happens a lot. Uh, but they actually do have a right for their speech. As an employer, including nonprofits, uh, you represent a lot of individuals. You represent people that work for you, employees. You represent stakeholders, your, uh, investors in your company. Uh, you also represent your customers. So Citizens United allows that these employers, which also include nonprofits and unions, to go out there and speak around election time to benefit the group of people that make up those organizations. Uh, Leo spoke a little bit about how cor um, corporations are not people. Uh, that is true. That I think Mitt Romney was famous to say that corporations are people or something like that, and oftentimes it's used out of context. Um, but on the flip side of uh, employers having speech, a lot of times communities want to hear from their employers. A really good example I try to uh, tell people is obviously we have a governor's election in Massachusetts uh, next week. Uh, a lot of times these candidates running for higher office come out with positions that impact industries in Massachusetts. For instance, the two governors have weighed in question one. They have positions on the yes and no. I think they're divided on that. Uh, so a lot of times, in this case, uh, hospitals or unions representing nurses will want to come out and publicly speak. And a lot of times, the people want to hear from those interested groups, too. So they want to hear from the community hospitals. What's your position on question one? What's, what's uh, the governor's and the challenger's position on question one? So a lot of times, not just the employers, but it's the people involved in those communities that want to hear from you know, the, the businesses, the unions, or the nonprofits that they know. Um, so hopefully that makes some sense as far as it's not just employers or big boogeyman employers, but it's a lot of regionalized uh, uh, organizations that just want to go out and speak. Uh, the second thing is that question two would actually uh, establish a commission or a committee as Leo was discussing. I think there's 15 people on that committee. And he mentioned that the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate President, four of the five, and the Governor would have three votes for each, or three surrogates for each uh, position. So in Massachusetts, unfortunately, that means four of the five would be Democratic. As an RTC, you can see the imbalance there. And it doesn't guarantee that the Governor, who's up for re-election, if he wins, would appoint Republicans to that. So right now you have 15 people that are surrogates for elected officials who would basically be tasked with ways to regulate the public speech. And that's what this really comes down to. Do you trust 
elected officials to regulate the public's speech. If you do, then you should vote yes on question two. If you have problems with that, especially the composition that I just outlined, where four of the five electeds right now are Democrats, and they have three votes each, then you would vote what I'm voting, which is no. Uh, the Constitution, the First Amendment, was actually drafted just for this one reason. It felt, and it's been long-standing practice, that it feels that the public is best equipped to regulate the public speech. Not Congress, not the President, not the legislative branch. No elected officials should be out there regulating speech. To put that in other perspective, and this goes uh, against a different reaction I've ever had, I, I mentioned this too, but how many people would be okay with President Trump and Speaker Paul Ryan regulating your speech? And this crowd probably a little bit more. But a lot of times they say, well, how about uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and President uh, Cory Booker? The point is, when you start talking about national level, it brings it back home to you that these are elected officials who have their own interests, and you're asking them to regulate the public speech. Um, and the third thing I would just say is, if you vote yes on question two, this commission, which is comprised of elected officials or surrogates, is tasked with regulating your speech. The proponents of question two already have the amendment drafted. You heard Leo talk about it. I think he quoted it a little bit. But it basically says, it's an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that only recognizes individuals as having any constitutional rights. Let me just say that again. It's an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, so only people, individuals, would have constitutional rights. So what the heck does that mean? Well, that means places of employment, like this restaurant, nonprofit organizations, unions, would all have no constitutional rights. So this goes way further than Citizens United or Campaign Finance Law. This is about recognizing who actually has constitutional rights. Um, when I talk about this with other folks and with people in the media, I often say, uh, I can't go to Kitty's and say, I would like the personnel records of all the employees here. The manager would tell me, there's a door you can leave. Just like the North uh, Reading Police Department can't, can't come to Kitty's and say, I want all the personnel records. They would say, go get a search warrant. Companies have rights defended in the Constitution. Uh, you can't just go into companies and search and seizure them. Uh, and there's many other constitutional rights that nonprofits and employers and unions have. So this amendment that's already drafted just recognizes individuals. It's not saying that companies have, or nonprofits or unions have the same rights as individuals. We know that is not true. Individuals have different types of rights, but it would strip those entities of all their rights that they, they can exercise that they have right, right, right now. Um, so, in closing, this just comes down to one thing. Do you trust government officials, elected officials in this case, to come up with ways to regulate your speech, the public speech? If you do, vote yes on question one. If you don't, vote no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, now we have 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, does anybody have a question to ask of either of these two young fine speakers. I think this is Irene Yule. <laughs> <laughs> I would do nothing. Okay, um, I have a question. I do love the expression that you use, equal representation for all. I definitely agree with that. I think everybody in here would agree with that. Um, and as I understand it, for this amendment, or this question, it relates to only corporations. Um, there are a lot of candidates who are well-funded. Yes, most candidates are well-funded by small donors, large donors, corporations, and unions, and all that. Um, so I, up until June, I had to belong to a union. So I know that my union um, has well-funded many candidates. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, I think when we spoke before, Leo, I had asked you this question, but I don't know if anything has changed yet with that. So this would limit corporations from giving unlimited funds, but does it include unions, or can unions continue to give unlimited funds? Thank you. The proposed uh, amendment to Constitution applies for campaign financing, all artificial entities, whether they be corporations or they be unions or they be nonprofits, they are all artificial entities. 
as opposed to natural persons with constitutional rights. Uh, does that address the question? Uh, that. Uh, so, uh, I think that the profits can't so we would all be limited to $2,500 per candidate. That would be, so unions could also not um, contribute more than that. I mean, unions are made up of individuals, but so are corporations. But unions are probably just as uh, more powerful than large corporations. So and I don't know if you have an answer to that. Do you still want to follow up? All we're saying here is what you're doing is specific rules here in the Commonwealth. All this amendment would do is say the government shall regulate. What those regulations will be will be determined by the individual legislators within the Commonwealth and within the other states in the United States. So individual numbers may go up, may go down, I don't know. This is when it gets really complicated. In Massachusetts, unions, including out-of-state unions, can give to state candidates up to 15 grand. All of us can give up to 1,000, and every employer cannot even give one penny. So this is a perfect example of campaign finance law being used as a weapon, where you have three sets of winners and losers. Unions can give up to 15 grand to candidates, individuals 1,000, and employers, businesses, can't even give a penny. Uh, this amendment would not address that issue. This amendment to the U.S. Constitution would strip all unions, all employers, businesses, and all nonprofits of all constitutional rights, which goes way beyond campaign finance law. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? <laughs> Eli Spicer, North Reading. So. You're saying that the uh, that it's already written, or that's what you said about it being already written. Um, you said that it was. It sounded like you was quoting it already written. Yes. But when I was just reading through what it says, it would choose 15 people to write. But they won't take yeah, that. It's not already written. It's, they're going to choose the language in which it's written. And now I will admit they have a vested interest. I'm a little Best sketchy on that. Yeah. Not too happy about it. But it's not already written because they will change it and they will reward it. Sorry, that wasn't a question. I guess my question was how can we ensure that it's fair to everyone? and make it work. The light bulb just went off in your head? Yes. Uh -huh. you wasn't already? No, no, but you now you see the light, right? That's exactly the problem when you empower elected officials to come up with ways to regulate public speech is you're hopefully they're going to do it right. So you're asking me, did I quote the amendment? Yes, in fact, Leo quoted the amendment because it's on their website. They have a amendment ready to go. And that's why I was debating with artificial, you know, he was talking about artificial intelligence. So the ballot question alone says 15 people will get in a room and come up with a way to amend the U.S. Constitution. Those 15 people will be three from the Secretary of State, Democrat, three from the Attorney General, Democrat, three from the Speaker of the House, a Democrat, three from the Senate President, a Democrat, three from the Governor, depending on who that is after November. So those 15 come up with a way to regulate the public speech. Leo's group has it already written on their website, and that's what we're debating, which is the artificial intelligence would be the or artificial entities would be the groups which are nonprofits, corporations, and unions would have no constitutional rights. So there's a lot of things that could happen along the way, but if you vote yes on question two, then you're saying government officials should regulate the public speech. If you're saying no, you're saying the Constitution is good enough, the public can regulate its own speech. Uh, Paul, I have a slight difference of opinion in this regard. What we're doing is proposing language for a constitutional amendment. On this topic right now, in Congress, there are over a half dozen different proposals. What we're trying to do is get our Congress to address the problems which I have outlined tonight. We have our ideas of what it would be, and 
Yes, we have written our ideas, but they're only our ideas. And once Congress proposes what the amendment should be, it then goes out to the 50 states. And 38 states have to ratify it and say, yes, we want this to be the Constitution of the United States. It's not merely the four Democratic state officials that happen to be sitting in Boston right now. I've got four minutes. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. I just uh, I have a clarification question on, on the issue. Uh, uh, the 15 members are surrogates of the respective positions in, in the state. They are not elected officials, is that correct? Citizens. The requirement is that it be citizens. However, historically, we know when the legislature appoints commissions, they many times do appoint other legislators. Okay. All right, then that seems to be in on question two, if there are no more questions to question two. Now we're up to question three. Uh, ballot question number three uh, is for the transgender anti-discrimination to keep in place or repeal current law on public accommodation pertaining to gender identity. The yes speaker is Ken Tarr. Ken Tarr is, has been a resident of North Reading for over 30 years. He is the general manager of a manufacturing company where he has been employed for 39 years. Presently, Mr. Tarr is the chairperson of the Land Utilization Committee in town and is one of the managers of the North Reading Farmers Market. He is also the proud papa to seven grandchildren, one of whom is transgender. Please welcome Ken Tarr. Thank you. Good evening. So as you know now, my name is Ken Tarr. Just want to take a moment to let you know why I believe you should vote yes on question three to uphold protections for transgender people. First off, you, I was going to tell you a little about myself, but Jeff kind of covered that pretty much. Uh, in addition to all that, I've also been working in North Rain youth soccer for over 20 years. Um, as a member of the First Baptist Church of Medford, I have worked on the Board of Christian Education, been a member of the Diaconate, taught Sunday School, led the youth groups, and even now I lead as the moderator. So, and as Jeff said, I'm also known as Papa to seven grandchildren, one of whom is transgender. So how does all that get me here? It doesn't. Ten years ago, I would have come to a forum like this looking for information because I didn't understand what it meant to be transgender. I distinctly remember reading an article in the Sunday paper about twins in Maine. And one of them started asking at the age of four, when do I get to be a girl? This sparked a conversation with my wife to say, where would that come from? Why would a four-year-old ask that unless they really felt they weren't in the correct body for their being. And keep in mind, this is well before any of this was introduced in TV shows or on programs. Then came the real challenge. As a slightly older than middle-aged adult, it was a case of receiving a new education when I was enlightened over six years ago that my grandchild was transitioning to become the person that they truly had been struggling to become throughout their young life. This was not an easy change for me to understand or to adjust to. The strength of my daughter guided me to realize that none of this was a choice, but a reality, and that I was getting the opportunity to see the blooming personality emerged as this young child was allowed to live the life they knew they were meant to. My grandchild has one of the strongest personalities I know. 
If you haven't had the chance to get to know someone that is transgender and hear their story, if you do have the chance and you hear their story, you know that so many of them knew at such early ages that they were living in a body that didn't fit who they are. Question three on this year's ballot is about upholding protections for transgender people from discrimination in public places. It's about dignity and respect and about treating everyone as we would want to be treated. The law that people on no side are trying to repeal has been in place for over two years in Massachusetts. This has given everyone in our communities the right to feel safe against discrimination. It allows everyone to be able to go to the movies, out to eat, go shopping, or go to medical offices, and even enjoy our beloved Ipswich Park without the fear of harassment and discrimination. This law is about dignity and respect. My grandchild, who is transgender, has rightfully been able to participate in local children's programs and sports, as all of my other grandchildren have. That's how it should be. A few weeks ago, a Virginia middle school held an active shooter drill. Included among the students that were in the gym at the time was a transgender girl. While the staff secured all of the other students in either the boys' or girls' locker rooms, no one was sure where to send the transgender student. As a result, she was left in the gym with a teacher while it was decided where she should go. When she was finally allowed into one of the locker rooms, she was segregated in a hallway because there was a concern that she might be a danger to her fellow students, and that was prioritized over her personal safety if there had been a shooter. Imagine the trauma and embarrassment of, felt by that young girl being singled out and being made to feel less important than all of her peers. Question three would not change the Massachusetts school policies, but this is an example of how an individual could be discriminated against. Here in Massachusetts, our state law says that transgender people should be free from harassment and discrimination. I think we can all agree that everyone should be treated with dignity and respect. Vote no proponents would have you believe that this law presents a safety concern to the general public, but that is just false. They are using the same scare tactics and ads as they did before the bill was passed by a supermajority bipartisan vote by the Massachusetts legislature. In the two years since, there has been no uptick in safety incidents. Groups like Massachusetts Chiefs of Police Association and the Massachusetts Major City Chiefs Association have endorsed GS on 3 because they know that it is important to keep these protections for transgender people in place. A crime is still a crime, and nothing about these protections changes or diminishes that. Laws protecting transgender people from discrimination have been in place for a longer time in places like Boston, Medford, and Worcester with no increase in public safety incidents in the restrooms. For the past seven years, students have been able to use the bathroom that matches their gender identity. Here in North Reading, there have been no problems, and when it was put on the school committee agenda, a group of high school students arrived to deliver a message signed by students supporting the state law that upholds protections for transgender people. I am voting yes on three, I know that it will keep everyone in my family safe, my wife, my three daughters, and all of my seven grandchildren. On October 11th, women in Massachusetts made their voices heard at an event to launch the Not In My Name campaign to debunk the scare tactics around protections for transgender people. We all care about safety and privacy, especially in restrooms. Nothing about non-discrimination protects uh, protections puts anyone at risk. All the law does is protects transgender people from discrimination and harassment in public places. 
That is why 50 of the state's leading sexual assault and domestic violence prevention groups support ES on 3 to uphold these basic protections for transgender people in public places. Hundreds of businesses, large and small, have endorsed ES on 3. Eastern Bank, Legal Seafoods, Nike, Planet Fitness, and JP Licks are among those listed because treating all customers with dignity and respect is good for business and the right thing to do. The world champion Boston Red Sox, Boston Bruins, Boston Celtics, New England Revolution, and the New England Patriots have all joined the coalition to ensure that all of their fans can safely attend their events. Yes on three to uphold protections for transgender people has bipartisan support Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito both support the Yes on 3 campaign and even provided financial support. This law is about protecting the freedom of all Massachusetts residents, including those who are transgender, to live their lives free from discrimination. Protecting people from discrimination is about treating others as we want to be treated. Repealing this will open up the door to more bullying, harassment, and violence. Yes is positive. No is negative. If there is anything we can all use in our lives now, it's more positive. Be positive. Vote yes on three for dignity and respect for all. Thank you, Ken. Uh, our last speaker is, uh, to question three, is Debbie Dugan. Uh, Debbie is the oldest of six children, the mother of three grown children, and the grandmother of, uh, mother of six. Debbie served as an elected New Jersey school board member from 1991 to 2003, accumulating 23 years of dedicated public service for three different school districts. Debbie helped write and pass New Jersey legislation to stop the interpretation of school to work, a predecessor of Common Core. Her second bill, called Nose, Nosy Student Survey Bill, which protected students from answering questions, personal questions about their their home life. Ms. Dugan is secretary of the Watertown Republican Town Committee, an election commissioner, a Republican state committee woman, and an active member of the Massachusetts Republican Assembly. Debbie is also the chairwoman of the No on Three campaign, known to many as the bathroom and locker law. Please welcome Debbie Dugan. excuse me not standing up but um, it's uh, been a very busy week and it's only Tuesday night um, I live in Watertown as Jeffrey said and um, uh, I am the chairwoman of keep mass safe vote no on question three and what I wanted to I need to lift it up a little bit <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about a law that was put in place in 2011 to protect the transgender community from discrimination. So a law was already on the books. So in 2016, when this law was passed, it added gender identification to the law so that any man can self-identify as a woman and um, enter bathrooms, women's bathrooms, women's locker rooms, showers, changing rooms, and even homeless women's shelters. That's the part of this law that we have a problem with. We do not believe that anyone should be discriminated against for any reason. But we do believe that women and children and other vulnerable people should be safe when they use these spaces. And the other the vulnerable people that we talk about in our messaging is the transgender community because they do use women's bathrooms. So they come in, they do their thing, and they turn around and they leave. And they use them because they feel safe. There's been a lot of discussion about, you know, there's no uptick in reported crimes. Well, if you understand the severe penalties for violating this law, so I'll give you an example. A, um, a father 
is, has gone to pick up his child, who, a little girl who's at the YMCA for her swim lessons. She's in the locker room, she's changing out of her swimsuit, and he's waiting for her outside the door, where every good dad would be, waiting for her right outside the door. She's a little girl. And um, a man walks by him, and he's heading into the locker room. And this dad isn't aware of this law. And he said, oh, excuse me, sir. That's the ladies' room. The men's room is right over here. And the gentleman continues to walk in. And he says, hey, buddy, my, my, my daughter's in there. You can't go in there. That's discrimination under this law. Individuals and businesses can be fined upwards of $50,000 for multiple offenses, for instance, in a business, or they, can, or they can go to jail for a year. So if you were a business, or if you were an individual and you were warned about the penalty, would you make a complaint? Would you run the risk of a $50,000 fine or going to jail? I don't think so. But let me tell you about an incident that occurred two weeks ago today. It happened in Woburn at the Target. A mother and her three children were shopping there. And the little 10-year-old girl had to go to the bathroom. You know, the family goes to Target frequently. You know, it's their store. And the mom said, fine. The little girl walks off and goes into the ladies' room in the Target, and a man followed her in. He starts talking to her outside the stall. He told her her shirt was ugly, he didn't like her shirt. He tries to enter her bathroom stall. Thank God the lock held. Now he's trying to entice her to come out and he will give her candy. He changed from what he was wearing into something else. She saw a tattoo on his upper left arm. She saw another tattoo on his right calf. She was able to describe everything that went on perfectly. She, this man left the bathroom. She told her mother she told her father when he came home, he called the Woburn police. The Woburn police said, you need to come back down to Target and fill out a police report. And that's what they did. When they, the family got to the Target and got close to the door, the little girl did not want to go in. When they went inside, the little girl told the same exact story for the third time. The police wrote out the report, and the police talked with the parents afterward and said that they had a suspect that they identified from the surveillance cameras. However, they didn't think that necessarily a crime had been committed. A few days later, they interviewed the suspect. <coughs> he does identify as a woman. And he convinced the police that it was a misunderstanding. So no charges have been filed. This, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly the problem we have with this law. This family was very fortunate that this little girl, other than being emotionally harmed, was not physically harmed, was not sexually assaulted, was not kidnapped, and she is alive today because that bathroom door stayed locked. This is why we fight this poorly written law. Law was already in place that protected the transgender community from discrimination. We do not believe that anyone should be discriminated against, but we do not feel that women's safety should be at risk because of a poorly written law. 
I believe that the primary responsibility of every government, whether it's local, state, or federal, is to protect its citizens. Beacon Hill failed the women in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is a very bad law, and it needs to be repealed. I'm finished. I'd like you to vote no on three. Thank you very much, Debbie. Okay, so now we've heard two sides of question three. Uh, are there any questions for anybody? Oh, yes. I'm John. I'm John Russo. I'm from Rain. This law goes too far. The law allows currently that any any sex offender. Are you going to ask a question? No, I'm going to ask the question. Okay, as long as you're going to ask the question, I will. The law goes too far. That's statement number one. And convicted sex offenders. Any classifications, two or three of these sex offenders, they're allowed to go into these bathrooms. That's the way the law is written. Why is it written that way? Why do you have to have, why didn't they exclude that? It's only logical, so I'm asking a question of that gentleman. Why didn't they exclude sex offenders? The Catholic Church, and I'm a Catholic, has had extensive history with sex, sex offenders very difficult to change or not. Why should we risk people, children, in this kind of atmosphere? They cannot be changed, they say. Some do change, they become X. And this is all about transgenders. The other people who are suffering from this, there's no concern. So I'm asking, why isn't there no concern? The first question is why did they not include? Why did they exclude? Exclude. Convicted sex offenders. Okay, and the, and the second question? It's about the fact that uh, Okay. Okay, we all are concerned about safety and privacy, okay? And again, a crime is a crime and it is staying that way. And I have daughters, I have grandchildren, some of them are granddaughters. I'm concerned about them. But if there's a crime committed in a restroom, then it's still a crime. And that this is about the rights of the transgender community. And if they're you know inclusive of that, again, nobody is allowed to commit a crime in the restroom. But these are convicted sex offenders. You don't have any compassion for those people who are exposed to these people in a closed environment? That's not an adequate answer. Well, it's not, it may not be adequate for you, I'm sorry, but if someone is using a public restroom, you don't know when they go in to use a restroom for its purpose, that they're a sex offender, and if they are going in and doing their business, and then coming out without doing anything abnormal, or without doing anything illegal, then they have the right to use that restroom that they identify with. You're risking the public. That's the whole You asked your question. Um, would you like to respond? Thank you. Um, there were a number of amendments that were proposed to this legislation if, um, as it was being passed, and one of which was proposed um, by Shauna O'Connell from Taunton, and she recommended that the, the bill exclude sexual predators levels two and three. It was voted down. It was not amended. Another one of the amendments was to protect police officers 
who respond to calls in good faith so that they would not be charged with a civil rights violation. So there were a number of things that were put in place that would have protected uh, police officers and women, and, um, and they, were, they, they were voted down. They did not pass. Thank you. Yes? Name, name and town from which you come. Uh, my name is Tracy Cost. I live in North Reading. I'm just wondering, so was the amendment that level two and three sex offenders are just banned from any public bathroom anywhere? Because a female sex offender could assault a female child. A male sex offender can assault a male child. I'm not really seeing how the sex offender thing factors in at all. I guess we think differently. So you only get yes. No, I mean our issue is with with women, and because I I do consider women the weaker sex physically and less able to protect themselves. And, uh, but we don't, want, we don't want anyone to be the victim of a predator. This little girl, this little, this little girl was a victim. But obviously you don't see it that way. And, and, and to respond to um, my opponent's um, remarks, regarding they can't do anything illegal. But what this law does is that it opens the door and gives opportunity to people who will do harm. So they've now got the opportunity and they had the motive. So it's, it's, it's just not, it's not good for men to be in these spaces for women. And our objection is strictly about safety and privacy. Ken, did you want to respond? First off, a transgender woman is not a man. Secondly, okay, I agree with the person asking the question as far as both genders should be protected. If this is such a opening up the risk to such a danger, why are over 50 groups that protect women who have suffered from sexual assault or domestic violence in support of this? And if it's a problem with police protections, why are the chief of police's police in support of yes on question three? I, I have another question. Do you want to respond? Okay. I'll use my two minutes that I didn't use before. Um, regarding the, um, I'm trying to think how you phrased it now. Um, there was an incident last December in a women's spa in Milton. And uh, a transgender woman called and wanted to make an appointment for a full bikini wax. She was declined service because she has male genitalia. And this spa, while they do give Brazilian waxes to women, they do not offer that service for men. So this individual is a transgender woman with male genitalia and they do not provide that service. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't talk like this normally. You know, I mean, this is not the kind of conversation that I would normally be having with you. But it is, it is a necessity that people understand how far this law has gone and how it is really a threat to women and children, but to businesses. A, a lawsuit was filed against this spa owner and it was dropped. But mark my words, it'll be back. It doesn't make for good advertising right now during the campaign. Thank you. How many uh, minutes do we have? Three minutes? I believe uh, someone back there would like to ask a question. Oh, 
Do you have to come oh, forward? Alright, we'll keep it on wide. I, did you have me centered? Because I'll let you take my spot. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm Phil Healy, uh, North Rain. Been uh, here seven years. Thank you both for speaking about this. Very important. Uh, David, for you, but uh, again, feel free to chime in. And now, uh, may I just say, is that uh, you're being very brave in the face of uh, facts and decency to be here and talk and speak about what you're speaking about. And I just want to know if the uh, Mass First, is that Mass Family First? Is that the name of uh, your organization? No, Mass, oh. Mass, um, no. Uh, Keep Massachusetts oh. Safe. Thank you. <coughs> uh, have they, I was wondering if they actually had this in their repertoire for their research, if they were able, when uh, talking about their opposition to this, if they had watched movies like Song Like a Hunt, uh, Bosom Buddies, uh, Mrs. Elfire, Tawang Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, Tootsie, were they able to derive anything from that to kind of come to their decision right now and were they able to take from that and make kind of this uh, this bizarre kind of turn on this real real subject? I am not aware of their movie habits of uh, the rest of my team. But our issue is not with the transgender community. Our issue is about safety and privacy for women. It's a bad law and it needs to be repealed and it's up to the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to understand that this is about safety. It's a bad law, it needs to go away. Because this little girl was one of the fortunate ones. There will be a very significant and a very sad event if we do not repeal this law. Yes? How many minutes do we have? One minute. One minute. Leanne Gonzalez, your credit. Um, you made mention that there was already law in place for this. So my question is, if this was repealed, how does that law stand? What, is, what changed when this new law came in? There'll be no time limit on the answers for both uh, individuals. The change that occurred had to do with self-identification. And so any man can self-identify as a woman and go into these spaces. I mean, we cannot discriminate against people anywhere. But we can restrict the use by women's spaces by men. Okay. I'll use that question to address uh, what Debbie had to say earlier in that if, if all it was is by identity, whatever, uh, just as fact, the spa owner, the person who made the appointment at the spa, made that appointment to have a manicure. When the spa owner found out that the person was transgender, they canceled the appointment. And, in fact, there were no fines ever, ever levied on the spa owner and wouldn't be on any business owner. This is why so many businesses, big and small, are in support of ES on 3, including places like Planet Fitness that would do that because it would take several years and several claims before they would receive fines. Okay? I am sure that that minute passed. <laughs> No, but, that wasn't portrayed correctly. Well, our time is up. I mean, the 10 minutes are up and they had no opportunity. My question wasn't answered, though. If this was repealed, okay. what was the original law that you're saying that you're saying that transgenders were protected already? Shifted housing, led employment, okay. public education. Okay. That's what it's, uh, I just uh, want to know. Yeah. What, I want, excuse me, I want the speakers to answer the question, Sorry. please. Yeah. All right. Uh, so just to clarify, yeah. your question is, what was the law before. before? Is your question, did it become defunct? It didn't get answered. What was the law in 2011, and what added in 2016 compared to 2011? Right. So the, if this is repealed, does it go back to the original law? 
Does anybody know the answer to that question? Does it go back to... Okay, wait. You're going to yield to someone who would know the answer. Okay. Name? My name is Jody, um, and I'm also a resident of North Rennie. Um, so the 2011 law protects transgender individuals in housing, credit, public education, and work. It doesn't protect them in any other facets of life. The 2016 law covered them in places of public accommodations, which is hospitals, buses, parks. Um, the um, No on Three campaigns um, putting forth that the law would just, would it change anything is based on the fact that there was for, um, some guidance around it that transgender people shouldn't be discriminated against from the Massachusetts, I might have heard the group that did it, but the Ma Com Commission Against Discrimination that said you shouldn't tra discriminate against transgender people in other public places, but it was just guidance. It is not a law, and so therefore, the law is very important because of other things happening on a federal level, that guidance would not protect transgender people if there are other federal laws, um, but this law would protect people in all facets of life, outside of work, home, school, and credit. Thank you. This is a bad law. It needs to be repealed and let the legislature fix it. It allows any biological man to go into a women's bathroom, locker room, shower, changing room, and even women's homeless shelters, and even convicted sexual predators. That is our concern. That's why it needs to be repealed. No one should be discriminated against. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this will bring uh, uh, the forum to a close, but before we do so, I'm going to ask everyone to stand for a moment of silence for those who have died in the synagogue in Pittsburgh and those who have been wounded and severely wounded and who have been emotionally traumatized uh, by by that event, uh, none of us, you know, we're fortunate. We live in North Reading, and we don't have not had that experience, and hopefully, we never do. So let's do a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. I hope that you found that this forum was helpful, that it was objective, that the presenters were uh, informative to you. Uh, that's the purpose. It's uh, uh, always our goal for the North Reading Republican Town Committee to you know, play our part in the community in helping the community be well-versed, knowledgeable on the issues, regardless of what their uh, decision-making is. So, Thank you to these wonderful uh, speakers. I please give them all an applause. Thank you for your time. You're, you're great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. And thank you, Kitty.